Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's the Steel City Blitz Steelers podcast presented by Deck Roofing Incorporated of South Florida, serving all of your roofing needs down in the Sunshine State, where they continue to violate all kinds of social distancing orders. Anyway, uh, you're not here for any of that crap. You're here to talk some Steelers. And uh, with me, as usual, is uh, Mr. Ben and Mr. Ian and... uh, Ben, how are you this fine, fine April evening? I'm just fine. I got a beer. I got a dog sitting here looking at me as I'm recording a podcast. I'm, I'm Out, good. Outstanding. Boy, life is good there. Yeah. And uh, Ian, how are things in the Commonwealth there? Things are good. Thank you for calling it the Commonwealth, too. I really get annoyed when people say things like, you know, we won the state championship. I think everything should be called like Commonwealth, like we're Commonwealth champions and things like that, you know. <laughs> well, um, very few people know that. I mean, I'm a, a history, social studies person. So I, I what, there's only like one other Commonwealth, isn't there? There's like four. Four there's total? four in yeah. total, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kentucky, Connecticut in virginia virginia that's, that's the one well, i knew of you know you can hang the fact that pennsylvania is just like kentucky on your mantle there that's a great thing <laughs> <laughs> well they see pencil tucky was uh, uh trending this week so that's you know they, that's they say good. it's pittsburgh and philadelphia and kentucky in the middle so yeah you know i i remember being told that years ago and i i just i did i started laughing when i saw that this week but i digress uh Guys, I am so excited for the draft, um, and and it, it's weird because there's an excitement level, but being Steelers people, there's also this this kind of reserved excitement because we don't expect to really have anything to do on Thursday with round one, and you know, with us not picking till forty nine, it, it's just a weird feeling. Doesn't matter. I'm still watching the draft. I'll be deeply involved in the draft, um, but it's just it's just a weird feeling. But either way, I'm excited for it. This complete lack of sports and everything else is um, uh, just just awful, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, so I'm excited about it. And um, last week we previewed some of the offensive people we thought the Steelers would be looking at in this draft, and so this week we'll flip around and look at the defense. So we know there's some, you know, obviously top tier defensive linemen that the Steelers are most definitely not going to see, like a Derek Brown of Auburn, a Javon Kinlaw of South Carolina. But Maybe. really, perhaps, yeah, he's, yeah. He's got some injury uh, questions. He may fall, but he, he, but you don't see him falling that far, do you? No, no, no. Yeah. I doubt it. Um, yeah, no. Um, I, I think it probably begins with with Ross uh, Blacklock out of TCU, Neville Gallimore out of Oklahoma, and and Marlon Davidson in Auburn, Justin uh, Matabuke uh, from Texas A and I mean, Ian, where, where does this begin and end? Because I don't really know that there's like a true nose tackle, and furthermore, I don't know that they're looking for a true nose tackle. I'd agree with that, and yeah, and Matabuke is more of a sort of. I'll say three, four defensive end, you know, like a right. five tech type player. Um, Gallimore, Brown, we already said we have no chance at, but Gallimore and uh, Blacklock from TCU are definitely more inside type guys. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, they already have six guys on the defensive line that are under contract, which is typically all they keep. So right. unless they're planning on saving a million dollars in cap space and cutting Daniel McCullers, which I don't know how he's still on the team and it's something <laughs> they should do, but I don't, know if they will um you know that's the really the only hole they have to fill um the word on the street kind of is that tyson alu is going to get the first crack at the nose position you know mm-hmm. in those 20 percent of snaps when they're even in a, a base defense of a, right. a three four i mean the, the nickel is essentially the base now they play nickel 75 plus percent of the time anyways that they only have two down linemen so they acquired chris wormley from the ravens as a Mm -hmm. rotational Mm -hmm. guy he'll slot in they still have isaiah bugs who they drafted last year and as long as stefan to is healthy which is the big question mark on the line the defensive line other than cornerback is probably the deepest position on the team so this is not a high draft need despite losing javon hargrave in free agency Mm -hmm. um you know some other names i've seen thrown out there ohio state's devon hamilton utah's um lakey fotu uh you know none of these guys are you know your casey hampton types but no one in this day and age is gonna play uh, you know, the number of snaps that Casey Hampton did uh, as a true, oh, God, no. you know, one tech, zero tech kind of guy. Um, 
and you can get guys like you know Hamilton, Fotu, those guys later on in the draft mm-hmm. um, that are those you know big hulking just guys in the nose um, because their position is not as valued anymore. So you can get those guys later later on, um, where in previous you know 10, 20, 30 years ago they probably would have been first round picks. Now they might be third or fourth round picks. It it, it is incredible how as much as we talk how offense has evolved in the national football league defense has too, because we can all remember doing these podcasts um, and, and talking about how the Steelers were in the nickel at say 55% of the time or 60%. And now it's jumped upwards to 70, 75%. So with that in mind, Ben, what, if you're looking for a defensive lineman, what type of defensive lineman are you looking for? If you're the Steelers? Uh, ideally you want, I mean, perfect world. Yeah. Yeah. You want a nose tackle who can play three tech. Um, and if you find that guy, you're going to draft him very early because he's Mm going to be gone very early if you don't. Um, but I don't know if that's what they're going to do. There are no zero reports of the Steelers having any interviews with a defensive lineman. None. And it's weird because as the end pointed out, they don't really – I mean, they've got a true nose tackle in in Dan McCullers, but he's really not a very versatile guy. He's just a plugger. That's it. Yep. I mean, basically, yep. he's a guy who has a place in short yardage situations and goal line mm-hmm. defenses, and that's really about it. He's, he's not a very versatile player. Um, he's got ability, but he rarely flashes it. And you apparently have to, you know – hit him with a cattle prod and really piss him off in order to, to make him dominate. But when he does, he does. Yeah. You know, uh, but uh, I I don't know what direction they're going to go there. My suspicion is that it's not that high a priority to them. Right. But that it should be a little higher priority and we'll see what comes of this, but eh, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the direction they're going. Uh, Ian mentioned that they only have that one hole. I think they also need a safety, really, on defense. They need a third safety. And what they've got right now in Jordan Dangerfield, that ain't enough. Mm-hmm. So I would argue that there are at least two gaping holes and that they need depth throughout that defense as well. But those are the two big ones I see. Yeah, oh, and, I just and, meant the only hole on the defensive line. Sorry, I I, yeah. I agree. We need a backup edge rusher, backup inside linebacker, and backup safety. I agree with you there, Ben. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the, third, the third the third safety sure. would the third safety will play a lot. He won't be a backup in the truest sense of the word. He's he'll just be like a he'll get some field time. Yeah. Yeah, he'll he'll be like a one A starter, not a guy who's really in the starting rotation. The way a nickelback used to be. A long time ago. Now a nickel, mm-hmm. a nickel corner is a legitimate starter. Yeah, he used to be a guy who just came in on passing defense, which was less than fifty percent of the time. Now he he plays a lot. Um, the way that guy used to be, that's that's the evolution of the mm-hmm. Steelers' safety right now. And that third guy, the more versatile he can be, the more they can use him in those sets. Um. Yeah, you, you yeah. get the point. We're, we're yeah, getting ahead ben, of ourselves here. Yeah, and, and, and brings up a really good point here, though, that actually what we need is more of not a traditional free safety or strong safety, but more mm-hmm. of like a, a dimebacker, you could call it, that uh, is a guy who's a little bit oversized for a safety, but can play as a, a linebacker in um, you know those long passing yeah. situations where Let's you can see. take Vince Williams off the field and move a safety in there. So kind of a hybrid inside linebacker safety type player. Well, let's let's hold off on that thought because we're. I, I think we're going to spend a lot of time on that when we do get to the secondary because I, I know I have several different guys in mind and questions for you guys too. So let let let's push that to the back for a minute. Um, and and any anything else defensive line wise? I mean, my only concern here is if Tuit goes down again, there there's really no way you can rely on McCullers for any long-term uh, no. usage in there. You know, so now all of a sudden you go from a, a pretty decent situation to, to a pretty negative one. And that's why I think late 
you know, sixth, seventh round, you might see somebody in here. But but then again, they've they've picked up what nine different guys from uh, the XFL already, and I think one or two of those guys are defensive linemen. And and I don't have any uh, uh, delusions of grandeur that they're going to be unbelievable. But but you never know if you get lucky with one or two of them. Um, let's see. Let's move on to uh, let, let's go to the interior linebackers here, guys. Where um, I, I I'm surprised, quite honestly. Um, at the number of people who just kind of shrug this off as, eh, you know, they're they're okay, they're fine. I, I mean, what is there, Ian, besides, you know, obviously Devin Bush, Vince Williams, and maybe Ulysses Gilbert, which we don't really know much about because he was hurt last year. I mean, do, do they need to draft a linebacker here? Yes. I, I Yes, but I, going back to my earlier point, I think it depends on, you know, kind of how you mm-hmm. view that that nickel dimebacker safety type role, right? If yeah. you can get a player that's a hybrid type guy that can kind of fill both positions with only one player, um, then, you know, you're, you're far and away ahead of the game that mm-hmm. – that kind of player can start his rookie year coming in on, on, you know, third downs or long passing downs, take Vince Williams off the field. Um, Then you have a guy who can flow, who can cover, um, but who's kind of bigger than a traditional safety. So strong enough against the run that, you know, if you get those draw plays, things like that, but they can also cover tight ends and running backs going down the seam or leaking out of the backfield. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of those type of players in this draft. Um, and I think we'll probably talk about those more when we get to the safeties. Yep. Um, but just a couple of guys I want to highlight that I like. Um, Mississippi State's Willie Gay Jr., no relation yep. to former Steelers cornerback William Gay. Um, this, cool. I mean, this guy is – he can fly around the field. He's got a mean streak to him. Mm. Um, you know, he's got – he just plays with an edge and a nasty attitude. Um, and then two Big Ten guys, Malik Harrison from Ohio State and Kalik Hudson from Michigan. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Kalik Hudson was a local kid, played high, played high school football at McKeesport here in the Whippeal. Um, But he kind of played that Viper role for Michigan, mm-hmm. which is sort of a slot defender edge rusher type. Um, it's not one of their like four down linemen, but he did blitz off the, off yeah. the slot a lot too. Um, he's he's undersized for an edge rusher. He he can't right. play on the edge, right. um, but he's got the speed and athleticism, especially in like short zone coverage that he could stick with slot receivers. He could, he, he could body him up physically. He could stick with tight ends. He could stick with running backs. Um, and he was really good in kind of a, a short to medium zone coverage for Michigan mm-hmm. whenever he dropped back into coverage too. And he was fast and athletic enough to, to play in, um, you know, to play in man coverage with tight ends too. So a guy like Kalik Hudson that it would take some time for him to move into the middle, you know, having yeah. played on the edge for Michigan for a while, but you know, a guy with athleticism like that, that can come in and passing situations is really what they need. Um, and then potentially as they start to learn the defense, you know, Vince Williams on the older side, then mm-hmm. you, you maybe slot them in as a starter down the line. But for this year, for 2020, it's going to be Vince and Devin Bush are the starters. Um, but potentially looking at, you know, find someone who's either, you know, an undersized yeah. outside linebacker, an oversized safety um, is probably going to be where the inefficiency is in this draft. Because really, as far as inside linebackers go, you've got Kenneth Murray from Oklahoma, Patrick Queen from LSU, and however you want to define Isaiah Simmons from Clemson. Uh, but that's pretty much it as far as like, talented inside guys yeah. the, i like kind of like the kid from texas tech the kid from wyoming's not bad either um i think it's jordan brooks and i think wilson's the kid from Wyoming. Wyoming. Yeah. yeah yeah um but beyond beyond those guys this this is a pretty weak draft for inside linebackers it, it, it is. is and and I'll, the one thing i'll say before i throw it to ben is uh you know having seen a lot of Kali cuts and at the collegiate level uh what what'll scare you is if the ball is run right at him um you know they michigan was taken to overtime by army last year and um they they literally ran at Kalik hudson every play <laughs> and that poor kid i give him credit he stood in there but they just <laughs> blow him over every single time uh so, well, so he's, only, he's only like 225 i mean he's he, not yes. big enough to play on the no. edge against offensive linemen he's no, got to stay clean which is why the inside is probably yeah, the best bet for him exactly keep keep him a little fresher get the big guys in front of him for sure um 
Ben, I, I, where are you here? Are you in a situation where, you know, we really need some depth here? You're not going to die if they don't address it? Where where are you on that? Uh, I think they need they need a Tyler Medikevich type, a guy yeah. that can that can be the the eventually be the journeyman linebacker who plays special teams for you, who kind of leads the younger players. And he's not going to be that guy this year, obviously. Mm-hmm. But what they need is a guy that can develop into that role this year. I don't I don't see them going inside linebacker early, uh, second or third round. Right. But I do think they take one um, at some point here. And, and that guy is a guy that they're going to want to develop into, I don't want to say a team role model, but I kind of think that's what Matikevich was. You know, he was a guy who wasn't very talented, frankly, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just kind of overachieved because he worked his ass off and he was smart. Yeah. And that's what they're looking for there, in my opinion, as a smarter player, because they're going to try, they're going to need to try and get value late in day three. You know, uh, and that's probably what they're going to the way that they're going to have to address it. I think that edge is a far more pressing need than inside linebacker. And so okay. prioritizing those things, you just have to go, well, you know, you take your edge guy this year and you, you develop him and he, he's probably going to have to be a starter within a year or two. Or he may have to be probably is the wrong way to put it. They, they want to yeah. try and sign. Uh, Dupree, Dupree to a long-term deal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be the case. Mm-hmm. I yeah, suspect yeah. it won't happen because I, you know, as we talked about a bunch of times before, it's just too much money to, to be paying TJ Watt $24 million a year, which they're going to end up paying him next yeah. year. And, yeah. and also pay Bud like $16 million on top of that. And, you know, <laughs> the economics of that, <laughs> yeah, the economics yeah. of that are just, just this. I mean, Bud's going to have one shot at getting the, ma- the massive contract, and if his if his agent settles, he's an idiot. And um, <laughs> because Bud's only got one shot at it. Yeah, you know? he, no, you're right. He's at that that perfect. Yeah. Probably not the right word, but he's at that that time where uh, you really fun. only have the one big shot. You know. Anyway, um, this what I was starting to say was I yeah. I don't think now maybe they'll get lucky and I'll be wrong because I didn't think that Vince Williams was going to turn into what he is, but I don't think that, th- that this is the year they find Vince Williams replacement. Okay. I would agree. Now, that said, Vince was a sixth round pick. He was a sixth round pick, but he wasn't just a sixth round pick. He was a compensatory sixth round pick. Yeah. He so basically practically a seven. a seven. Yeah. And you guys believe Vince is 30 years old this year. Yeah. It's yeah. incredible. Vince, Vince has even said, <laughs> On Twitter, he's like, "Yeah, I'm on my way out. I know this." Yeah, and you know, I I keep telling these young guys, "You got to do this. You got to do that." Da 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 da. da. <laughs> it's just like you're talking to the young guys now. Wow. There, there's, you know, there's a. You were talking, Ben, kind of at the beginning of your comments about bringing in somebody that that leader type, Medikevich type. There's a there's a kid uh, out of Stanford, Casey Tuhill. Um, he, I was just going to talk about him with the edge guys. Go ahead. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is he, he was more inside in, in some of the draft people have him as an edge. Cause he's, he's six, four, about two fifty. Um, mm-hmm. He's not great against the run, but he's, he's a great leader. He's widely respected. Um, he, he just does, he hustles great motor, all the typical attributes, you know, and I, I just happened to stumble on him and was watching him a little bit today. I don't know that he can play inside, but man, um, the perfect type guy that that Ben was talking about there. Um, And and then another interesting guy that would probably, he's probably going to go a little earlier because he's really athletic, is the kid from Colorado, uh, Davian Taylor, who's, who's only played like two or three years of football. Um, didn't, didn't play in high school hardly at all. And, and then just just started playing and thought, you know, I'm pretty good at this, uh, and, and got a scholarship. There's, he's really raw, but there's tons of upside to him. So I I agree with you guys. I think it's probably going to be late, um, that they do this and, and who that is. I, I really don't know. Ian, did you have final thoughts on that? Uh, can we segue to talking about the edge guys so I can talk about two? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Let us segue. All right. So, um, last actually I started this a few years ago that I started tracking this but last year I wrote an article on the site 
Um, it was called how to identify early impact pass rushers. Yeah. Um, and basically what I did was I looked at all of the players um, since 2000 who had had a double digit sack season uh, within their first two years in the league. Um, now double digit sacks are one of the most consistent statistics for elite pass rushers over time. Um, so, I mean, you can look at stat, sacks have only been a stat since 1982, but nevertheless, right. you can look at more or less any year and it will pro the, the number of players that get to 10 plus sacks will probably fall within a range of like 15 to 22 players. And, and mm-hmm. like, Every year since from 2000 to 2018, when I wrote this article. Um, so, Ian, Ian, yeah. so let me just stop you here real quickly. So, what you're saying, and I, I just want to quantify this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the number of players that actually cross that threshold that remains consistent correct? on a year over year basis. Yes. Okay. That's and correct. that's why you're saying it's a very telling statistic. Yes. Because okay. only between, between 2000 and 2018, only twice were there fewer than 15 players that got double digit sacks in a season and only twice were there more than 21 players that got double digit sacks in a season. So in any given NFL season, you're probably going to have between 15 and 21 players that get 10 plus sacks. Um, But it's very rare that that happens within the first two years of a career. Usually it happens in years like three, four, five, and six. Um, So I looked at the guys that have that early impact and I found um, six athletic measures that, Mm -hmm. you know, from testing that a majority of these guys had. So for instance, you know, like 85% of them were six foot three or taller, you know, 87% weighed 250 pounds or more, things like that. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but just, you know, most of the guys break these thresholds. Um, so of these six thresholds uh, that I found, this year's class was kind of hard to measure because mm-hmm. a lot of the edge guys did not test at the combine. That's but true. there were there were three guys that checked all the boxes, basically. Casey Tuhill was one of them. Um, Derek Tezuka from North Dakota State was another. And uh, Jabari Zuniga from Florida was the third one. Now, granted... I'll caveat this. Chase Young from Ohio State did not do drills at the Combine. Right. Um, Clavon Chase on from LSU did not do drills at the Combine. Mm-hmm. Terrell Lewis from Alabama only did a vertical jump and a broad jump. Didn't run a 40, didn't do a shuttle, didn't do a bench press. So, um, you know, some of the some of the top guys did not do all the drills. So some there could be more guys on this list, but just going off the drills that we have, um, you know, those three guys were the three right. that met the thresholds. Potentially, for an, an early impact pass rusher. And this isn't hard and fast, but I mean, last year, Max Crosby from Eastern Michigan yep. um, checked five of the six boxes. He went in the fourth round to Oakland and posted 10 sacks as a rookie, which, yep. um, you know, is, is almost unheard of for, for rookies. Josh Allen from um, Kentucky checked all six boxes, got double digit sacks. He was the only other one as a rookie that did it last year. So, um, TJ Watt checked all the boxes, had double digit mm-hmm. sacks his second year in the league. So, um, you know, th- there is some some uh, backing to this as well from a statistical standpoint. But my point is, the Steelers have learned in the past that is much better off to gamble on athleticism for pass rushers, mm-hmm. see Bud Dupree and TJ Watt, than it is to gamble on unathletic guys that had big college numbers, see uh-huh. Jarvis Jones. Uh-huh. So given that the three guys with the highest athletic thresholds in this edge rushing class are all late round guys. I mean, nobody is projecting any of those three guys in the first five rounds. No, they're all those six, are, seven. Those are yep. all six, seventh rounders. We need to fill a hole at edge rusher, but if we're going to gamble on upside and athleticism, fill it with one of those guys and, and you know, don't, it's not necessarily a need early, Unless there's, you know, somebody that falls that you just can't pass on. Well, um, he, yeah, and, and here's I, what I will say: a, a warning on uh, AJ Spenza from Iowa is he does not check any of the athletic boxes. That guy, no. that dude is like, I mean, he's got some moves, but he is he ran a slower forty than Jarvis Jones did. My goodness, that dude can't move at all. Well, yeah, he, just, he's smart, but it does. I I agree with you. I think in that that particular case, you got a guy that looks like he's got a good jump off the ball. Mm-hmm. But he probably doesn't convert power to speed very well. Excuse me, speed to power very well. So it's it's not going to be, he's not going to do as well as a pro player. He was smart in college, and he was productive as a result. 
but he just the athletic limitations are going to keep him from being productive as a professional. And he's, that's why he started to slide a little too. You stay away from that guy. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating because Ian, you, you brought up the, the production thing they've started to move away from. I, I, I profiled, you know, for the site, Curtis Weaver out of Boise state who had like huge numbers in terms of sacks out there in in the mountain West he is the one of the most unimpressive looking edge rushers you'll ever see. He 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 just his as one scout I was reading about this week he said his he has a bad body. He just does, he's got a lot of body fat. He he just relied on uh, a couple of different things to get to quarterbacks. He he sometimes can be lazy, but he was productive. You know, so how do you how do you not pay attention to that? Well, I think Ian what you've brought up is a great point. You look at some of these other uh, factors involved and it can help you get a pretty good measurement on what these guys are going to do at, at the NFL level. And I thought you're bringing up Max Crosby, uh, Eastern Michigan was, was a great thing. Um, you know, who, who could have seen that coming? And when you looked at his factors, the, the five, six things you talked about, check the boxes, you know, I did. So, he was on the list I posted on our website last year. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you know? it's just, um, it, fascinating how it, it a little bit of research and stuff like that uh, uh pays off because um i i really like those guys towards the bottom i mean i think it's a much different class this year than it was last in terms of that where you know remember they you know they went with sutton smith i mean i i still don't really understand what that was all about but uh the, the one other name. name i'll bring up and i don't know if he's an edge guy or an inside guy mm-hmm. um is zach bond from wisconsin he kind of reminds me a little bit like chad brown that He's a little undersized to play on the edge, but he's got some athleticism and some speed. He doesn't check a lot of the boxes for the early impact pass rusher, but yeah. I mean, he I I think he could kind of be that variable guy. Um, I'm absolutely terrified of him landing in like New England and Bill Belichick being able to move him around that defense. Um, but he's a he's a really intriguing prospect because he can do multiple things. He's not just a pure edge rusher, and and he's been kind of all over the place in some boards I've seen too. So I, I you know who, who who knows? But yeah, he he is kind of a tweener type. Um, I do want to remind everybody that you are listening to the Steel City Blitz Steelers podcast presented by Deck Roofing Incorporated, serving Broward County and the Southern Palm Beach counties of Florida. Whether it's commercial, residential, multifamily, or condos. Contact Deck Roofing today by visiting deckroofing.com. All right, guys, um, I, I want to do um, – uh, I, I mean, do we want to do cornerbacks or do we want to jump into the safety talk? Let's do corners because there's not much to talk about. We are pretty okay. well set in our depth chart. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we're going to want to spend a lot more time on the safety. So, um, Ben, any corners that have caught your eye at all in this draft – I mean, Not obviously, really. it, I, yeah, no. I'll be honest. I really haven't spent much time at all. I haven't either. Yeah. Doing, um, doing any work on them because it's just not a position of need. No. Uh, the Steelers have got good depth there, at least this season. Um, mm-hmm. Next year, I think, you know, it, it could be a, a bigger issue. Um, I do. I did see one corner that I really liked, but I don't see them taking him. Yeah. Um, and that was where the hell are my notes? Well, it's a big year for Justin Lane too. I, I, I think, I think yeah. yes, but but you're talking about a guy that's going to be playing on the outside, right? Um, right. you know, and that could work out well for him. Jeff Gladney, Texas Christian. Yeah, do you see? I, I, oh, I he's see got a, a guy, nasty edge to him. Yeah. Uh, well, I just see a guy who's going to be a really, really good slot corner, outstanding nickel corner. And I don't think the Steelers are going to get him because they had to take him with one of those first two picks, probably their first pick in order to, t- to get him. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, I really like his game a lot. Uh, a guy who can tackle and also cover all over the field. That's a wonderful thing to have. And he, he's also got a nose for, for creating turnovers, but I don't see it happening. And that's where I'm going to yeah. stop. <laughs> yeah, and that's a great place too because he he is fascinating. Um, he, he's exactly what you want in a in a slot corner. Uh, really, he's what you want in a football player. Uh, he's aggressive, uh, covers well, creates turnovers, like you said. He's a so. little undersized. He's kind of a oh, oh, for sure. type guy, you know. Uh, but yeah. he's you know he's he's big enough to play in the spot. And he's twitchy. 
Yeah. He can, he's sticky. And he tackles. He tackles. And and your slot corner in the Steelers defense at least has got to be a tackler. And that's why, you know, some of our right. guys don't we have got to split time mm. because you got one corner who can tackle and another who can't. Cam Sutton is tackling's not really his forte. No, no. Um speaking of the plug here, uh yeah. we, Put the on the site. We put together a uh, Steelers top fifty draft board where you know we, you all were involved in, it, obviously. So you know, but I'll say for yeah. the listeners, we kind of went through the the draft and ranked the prospects based on how well they fit the the Steelers' needs, not necessarily who are the best athletes, who are the best players in the class. So you know, some players that didn't fit the Steelers' needs as well got dropped down the board. But Gladney was number thirty six on our on our Steelers. Oh, big okay. Board. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, you know, Ben, you were talking about tackling, and that has been an issue that has dropped Grant Delpit, a guy I really, really liked going into this year. His inconsistent tackling has, in in some boards, has dropped him completely into the second round now. Um, oh, he is a second rounder, for sure. Yeah. I, and, and, I thought he was a first rounder last year. And, I did, too. And he's, he's come back a little bit toward the pack. So, so I'm just going to throw this out there. If he's there at 49, would you take him? Hell yeah! I like yeah. Winfield better though. I love Winfield, man. <laughs> Winfield I like Winfield better, but yeah, but yeah. I, I would take him. I would take Delpit for sure if he was there because they need that guy. If having that third corner slash third linebacker, yep, available to you is a big, big deal. And you can you can also put uh, Edmonds at linebacker if you need to, really. Um, he could do it, yeah. you know, and, and he'd pull Vince off the field and you've got that guy who's kind of a hybrid linebacker safety. And then you've got a, you got two safeties behind him. That really sets that, that dime package off. And yeah, Delpit could play a role in there. And, you it, know, he, he, yeah, he's, he's slid some, there's no question, yeah. but I it's still ball think he's going to be a good pro. Too. Yeah, well, he's a good. I think he's going to be a good pro. I really yeah. do. I, I don't know if he's going to be like outstanding, but I think he's going to be good. The 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 fascinating thing here, uh, Ian, before I flip it to you, is is you know most of the rankings I see guys like Del Pitt. Then you get Ashton Davis from Cal uh, California, Jeremy Chin, Southern Illinois, Winfield's in there. Uh, the the Kyle Duger kid from from Lenore Ryan. I think it's a D two school. Uh, you know, they all are kind of sitting in there at that 49 range, and it's just really fascinating to me. But but earlier in the show, you were talking about the guy that would be that safety uh, linebacker hybrid type thing. So let, let's assume that's what it is. Uh, who are you looking for in that regard? Um, I think that kid from Southern Illinois, Jeremy Chin, could really fit that role. Um, yeah. He was the – the highest rated um, spark safety, which spark is a athleticism measure. Um, we've written about it on the site before that mm-hmm. Steelers have targeted. They don't specifically use spark as a rankings, but they've targeted guys that have high spark rankings or high athleticism rankings. So, um, you know, chin absolutely fits that role. If you're looking for a guy in the second round, um, I, I love Antoine Winfield's game. Maybe that's just oh. because I, uh, you know, he's awesome. <laughs> well, yeah, I was gonna say maybe that's just because you know I have some friends who are Penn State fans who have PTSD about that Minnesota game, where they're like just ball right. hocking all over the place. Um, I mean, Delphi, I think could be really good too. Um, I think Winfield has the NFL bloodlines that the Steelers like, but honestly, I think he might go at the late first round. I think someone might sneak in and grab him at the late, late first, early second. I don't think he's gonna be there at forty nine. Yeah. I, I think um, you're probably right. Unfortunately, he's younger too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the Ashton Davis kid from Cal, he had a few injuries, but I mean, he started as a, a track. He had a track scholarship, yes. walked onto the football team. Um, so he's he's got tremendous athleticism and upside for being a guy who really hasn't you know been in football. I mean, mm-hmm. he, he played football before, but he wasn't yeah. a scholarship athlete yeah. in football. Um, you know, if you're looking later on in the draft, like we don't have a fifth round pick, so either yeah. second, fourth, or our sixth round pick. Um, Brandon Jones from Texas, uh, Tanner Muse from Clemson, who's a guy that I wrote a draft profile on. He's uh, supremely athletic. He's a little oversized for a safety, 6'2", 227, mm-hmm. um, which makes him also a little 
undersized for an inside linebacker. I mean, you think Devin Bush was 5'11", 234. So, right. you know, could Tanner Muse pack on 10 more pounds and play inside linebacker? Kind of like a, you know, Dion Buchanan, Jeremy Cash type player. Yeah, I mean, Ryan Shazier was 6'1", 225. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Not the, the, impossible. Thing about, the thing about Muse is he's got really, really good straight line speed. Um, he actually he ran down J.K. Dobbins from behind in the uh, semifinal last mm-hmm. year. And for anyone mm-hmm. who watched Ohio State, you know how fast J.K. Dobbins is. And Muse ran him down from behind. And that was before Dobbins got injured in that game. Um, so Muse can fly in a straight line, but he's not really good side to side. Um and his his short area quickness isn't that good um so so he'd be a project player um the thing is he started his clemson career he's a fifth year senior he started his clemson career on special teams his first couple years so he blocked a few kicks he has experience um playing on special teams he knows what it takes um he was a team captain all year last year you know the kind of guy that the steelers love to take in those late rounds you know ben was talking about a tyler matikavich type you know tanner muse might be that guy that he's a um you know he's he's just a football player he's a team leader he's a vocal leader on the defense you could tell he, he knows where the guys need to be lined up um and he could be a really good special teamer in the NFL and and maybe develop into someone that could play on defense. Talking about the Clemson guys, I think their other safety, Kavon Wallace, is probably a better true safety as far as NFL terms are concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think, you know... He's a bit of a hammer, too. He, he, he yeah. comes downhill pretty hard. I don't know so much about his coverage skills. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then two other guys I have to give a quick shout out to because they're local prospects. Gino Stone from Iowa went to Newcastle High School, led them to the Whitfield Championship game. Um, he's a he's a hammer. I mean, he's a he's yeah. a true strong yeah. safety. Um, and, and box safety, can, box safety. Yeah, he can he can lower the boom. Um, and then on the flip side, Kenny Robinson, who started in the city league uh, here in high school, transferred to single A small school, Manny Christian High School. Um, then went on to West Virginia where he played for two years, uh, got kicked off the team for an academic reason, um, went to the XFL for a year mm-hmm. and is the only XFL player available in the draft. He's more of a true free safety. I mean, he had seven interceptions in two years at West Virginia, two picks in five games in the XFL. He's a he's a ball hawk on the back end, but his tackling is really slow. <laughs> I mean, he's he's a he he will fly to the ball and he can find the ball in the air and he's really good at finding the ball and, and snagging it, but his tackling is really bad. Well, he he yeah, was but, a guy. His, his tackling, and I, I I'm sorry to interrupt here, but no, his that's tackling fine. is is more of a technique deal where that is something that can be fixed. You know, where side to side agility, lateral agility, and coverage ability, there are little things you can do to improve upon that, but mm-hmm. that really just comes down to physical ability. And if you don't have it, you don't have it. Where tackling, it's about willingness. He's willing to tackle. He's just really sloppy. What he <laughs> needs is to be coached up. True. His coaching is, excuse me, his technique is terrible. And yeah, he's definitely a project guy if he gets taken, no question. But, but a good coach, hell, a mediocre coach yeah, could I, fix that. A high I wouldn't. Coach be, I wouldn't be surprised. That. I mean, yeah. the, the penchant they've had for XFL guys the last two weeks. I wouldn't be surprised if they drafted well, them. And we should talk <laughs> about that. We've got a minute, so why don't we talk about the why they've why they've signed so many XFL guys? I mean, basically, yeah. it comes down to the fact that signing you at EFAs this year, undrafted free agents, is going to be a shit show. I mean, they yeah. they don't have good information on these guys. They can't talk to any of them ahead of time, so they don't really have a sense for what their character is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be a combination of bringing them in, talking to them, getting to know them, giving them a physical, and then offering them a contract. Where in use prior, most years, it's just a question of, hey, we've talked to this guy, we like him, we're going to offer him a contract. They've already yeah. done their homework. This year, they've got to do their homework and sign the guys, and it's going to be a mad dash, a rush to sign undrafted free agents, which is why... Colbert was like, hey, why don't we make it a 10 round draft? You know, no, I, I, right, right. So basically what they've done is they've said, hey, let's just make sure we're gonna have we're gonna have our roster stocked with good players. We're gonna look at what we know about these XFL guys and the best ones available to us, we're gonna sign. Yeah, I I 
I think it's been a good strategy. And, and again, I don't want anybody to think that these are guys that are all going to be roster guys because they're not. In fact, no. some of them are nothing more than camp bodies. I am shocked. But, yeah, well, I know. <laughs> but you get guys that have been through a bit of a training camp, you know, in the XFL, and, and you know, they have that little bit more experience. And, and plus, like you said, they, they had a chance to vet them a little bit more than they will these these UDFAs, if you will. So um, any final thoughts before we wrap thing up? Uh, Ian, I assumed you wanted to mention something about the Chargers' new uniforms. <laughs> uh, they're they're fine. Whatever. I don't know. Um, yeah. So somebody um, said they have enough uh, new uniforms now for each of their fans. Probably do. They probably do. <laughs> well, um, combinations anyway, right? Combinations. Yeah. 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 12. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's you know, spend all this money to roll out new uniforms and you're playing in a soccer stadium, but I digress. <laughs> um, you know, I, I will say I didn't realize how much I missed sports until I was watching that Michael Jordan Bulls documentary on Sunday uh, night and yeah. I was glued to the TV. I mean, I love the Bulls in the nineties. I was a huge Jordan fan. I had posters on my walls and everything, but yeah. I, I really I really didn't, you know, realize how much I missed sports until yeah. I was watching that and um, I'm really excited for the draft on Thursday, partially because it's going to be a gigantic shit show with all these people trying to figure out technology and, you know, whose, whose internet's going to well, drop out. You know, there were, there were stories of, of glitches and people having home internet problems. Cause they didn't realize that their kids were all playing on their iPads and they couldn't do the zoom call and all that stuff. And it's going to be a gigantic shit show. I, and, We've got nothing else to do, so I'm completely here for you know three hours oh, of high comedy at the expense of every other NFL yeah, team. I, I I will be too, and and I I'm told that they're all they all have the direct hotline number right to the the guy. I can't think of his name, but he's the one that essentially hands the card to to whoever's calling the draft pick, and so so they don't think it's going to be that big a deal. But either way, we will be there for it. We will enjoy it. Um, and we will certainly be back to recap everything that the Steelers do in the draft coming up uh, early next week. Of course, the draft will be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, coming to you virtually from Roger Goodell's basement. Um, Yeah, I don't even know where to go with that. It could be somewhere bad. But anyway, uh, for Ian and Ben, this is Steel Dad signing off on the Steel City Blitz Steelers podcast. Thanks to our sponsor, Deck Roofing Incorporated of South Florida. And hey, everybody, go Steelers. Ravens suck. Go Madden Curse. Oh, I like it. <laughs>